we invited you to send some questions through to Professor Karim. Let's see uh, what, he, what answers he can give to some of the things that have been on your mind. Uh, let's pick up some of the questions that you've sent through, sent rather through to us from our social media platform. So this one coming from Sam Kelo on Facebook. Professor Karim, can you please ask him why it is that when lockdowns were imposed across the world, the numbers of infections went down, but in SA, numbers are going up every 24 hours despite five weeks of the lockdown. Uh, so, Professor Karim, that's the question from Sam Kelo. What's the answer? So, I actually have answered your question, and one of the reasons that we are seeing a steady increase in the number of cases is because we are doing much more testing day by day. If you look at, and you should look at the number of tests not just look at the number of cases. So when you look at the number of tests and you look at how it's going up, it gives you some idea of why the number of cases is going up. You cannot be doing twice as many tests and not get an increase in the number of cases. If you, that happens, that means you're wasting the test. So the fact that we now have an active case-finding process where we have over 30,000 people going door to door, uh, looking for people who have symptoms and testing them, then you're going to find cases. And so this increase in the number of tests is a reflection of why we are now seeing this increase in the number of cases. All right. It's simply a function of testing. Sure. All right, Professor Karim, let's bring you the next question also uh, coming through to us on Facebook. Bongani Khadebe, please ask Prof. Karim, our current recovery numbers are 25% of, to of the total number of positive cases. So is it safe for the economic hubs, at least the provinces, to move to phase four on the 1st of May, even though there are some red alert zones? So the issue about uh, people who are recovered, we basically go on the understanding that we know that most individuals will have totally recovered within 14 days from the time that they've had onset of symptoms. And we know that they are non-infectious thereafter. So you can pretty much go on the basis that from a time that the person is diagnosed, that you can count 14 days and you know that they would have recovered. There's still a backlog in terms of going to see those individuals and make a determination. And so there's always a bit of a delay from the time the 14 days occurs and the time that they are actively recorded as recovered. So that's why the recorded covered, recovered is slightly lower than what you would anticipate with the 14 days. So the issue then becomes, are those who have recovered, are they now protected from COVID? Would they get the disease again, would they get the infection again? And the answer to that is not so straightforward. What we do know at this stage is that patients who've had this coronavirus infection in the past, that we don't yet know if they are protected from getting the infection again. The data is still being collected on that. However, one of the things that seems to be emerging, and there's some evidence to suggest this at a preliminary level at this point, is that patients who've had the coronavirus infection who have recovered don't get corona, who don't get the COVID disease again. So even if they get infected, we think that they do not get the disease. So those who've had this uh, infection in the past at this stage, we don't know if they get reinfected, but we think that they do not get the disease again. How will we know whether they are now totally protected? Well, we are waiting for follow-up studies, and there are several underway. We need to follow people up for long enough to assess whether they will get reinfected or not before we can tell for sure whether this a single infection with this coronavirus protects you from subsequent infections, just like you have for measles and other diseases, that once you get the disease once, you don't get it again. We do not know yet whether that's a fact 
for the coronavirus. Sure, fantastic. Thank you so much, Professor Karim. We're going to take a look at the final question then that we've picked up on our social media platforms. This one coming from Twitter, Bongek uh, underscore 21, asking, in door-to-door -door screening, should the person being screened show symptoms of COVID-19? Do they and their entire family get tested there and then? Or is it left in the hands as a recommendation by the healthcare workers? So as it stands, we have a pretty standard procedure that once a person has symptoms and we think that that person may have the coronavirus infection, we regard that as a person under investigation. And so that person has to go and have a test. Presumptively, we assume that that person may be infected. And so we treat the household uh, as uh, exposed. But once that person's results become available, we then make a determination as to whether that person, if he or she is positive, will then need to go into isolation, and then the household contacts will need to go into uh, some kind of quarantine facility or quarantine themselves at home if they are able to do so. So that's a pretty standard procedure. It's a procedure we follow from the household screening. It's a procedure we follow for patients who come into our hospitals and our clinics or our doctor's rooms wanting, uh, coming on the basis that they have symptoms that may indicate that they have the coronavirus infection. Professor Karim, as always, it's a pleasure t chatting to you and thank you so much for taking uh, some of the questions from our viewers.